This is CBC Here and Now. Waiting too long. We'll have an update on this province's cardiac care program. Cardiac care is not in crisis right now. You, if you need surgery today, tonight, tomorrow morning, you're going to get surgery and it's going to be great surgery and you're going to be in good hands. Coming up on Here and Now. Roller coaster temperatures expected over the next week, but it does look like temperatures are climbing. Coming up on Here and Now, I'll explore why shoveling the snow off your lawn is such a popular activity in Labrador West. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Peter Cowan. Tonight, we're hearing from people struggling to find a balance. A family in Conception Bay South is facing tough choices. Do they buy food or medication? Rhonda Watkins says she reached a crisis point before Christmas and she resorted to taking expired insulin. And now she and the NDP are calling on the province to reevaluate who gets drug coverage. Here now is Arianna Kellen reports. It was the week before Christmas and Rhonda Watkins was desperate. She needed to make a choice by life saving insulin or the ostomy supplies to keep her body functioning. Watkins grabbed an old box of expired insulin and made her pick. I guess you're kind of playing the Russian roulette. You really don't know, but you know you have to have insulin, so you got to take that chance, you know? I mean, it's different than having an outdated bag of chips or something. In 2007, Watkins underwent surgeries that would later require her to have an ostomy. A year later, she was diagnosed with diabetes at the age of 40. The costs associated with these conditions are sky high. After losing her private insurance, Watkins turned to the Newfoundland and Labrador prescription drug plan. The program didn't cover any of the $4,000 she spends annually on ostomy supplies, but did pay a chunk of her diabetes medications and other drug expenses. But over the summer of 2021, her coverage went from around 50% to nothing at all. It was explained to me that our family income increased I think around two thousand dollars. I wasn't spending as much money on meds because I couldn't afford the meds, and uh, my son turned eighteen. Watkins is on disability. Her longtime partner makes a middle-class wage. Now they're remortgaging their home to plan for the future. We've taken from our savings. I've maxed my credit cards. I've had to go into my child's education fund. Watkins is now relying on insulin samples provided by pharmacies and doctors. A quick fix now, but the less she spends on medication, the lower her overall drug costs are, a disadvantage when she applies for future drug programs or tax credits. Oh my gosh, the, the, uh, the people we encounter who are now down to choosing rent, heat and, or, and drugs, and sometimes they're taking the drugs every third day to stretch it out. Jim Din is a vocal critic of the provincial drug plan. It's basically about serving government as opposed to serving the needs of the people. And in the long run, it's going to end up costing us all more. Walken says it's time for the province to reevaluate who should be covered. With inflation, high food prices and soaring gas costs, even higher earners could be stuck. If this is happening now at 53, what's going to happen when I'm a senior? How many more people are going to experience this? It's not fair. It really isn't fair. It's fun. I think the whole system, the policies need to be uh, uh, looked at, reviewed, streamlined, and start looking at a, a, at a person-focused approach. In a statement, the Department of Health and Community Services says as a person's financial situation changes, so may their eligibility for the province's drug program. A person's coverage and copay can also be impacted if they aren't filing their medications on a regular basis. The province says it's working to address the rising costs of living. Arianna Kellen, CBC News, St. John's. Eastern Health says it's now taking appointments for the second COVID booster for those who are eligible. So here's the criteria. You have to be 70 years or older, or if you live in a long-term care or seniors home, you can get it. Anyone who's over 18 and identifies as Indigenous or lives in a remote or isolated community is also eligible. Everyone has to be 20 weeks from their last dose. First booster doses are also available too for children aged 12 to 17. 
Returning now to our coverage about the lack of access to rapid tests. Newfoundland and Labrador is one of three provinces that doesn't widely distribute the devices for free. The tests are only handed out for free at schools and in high risk settings. Here now is Meg Roberts has more on how that's putting some low income earners in even more vulnerable positions. For 20 bucks, Angela Power can buy some bread, a carton of milk, a dozen eggs, the necessities. She doesn't always have an additional $20 to spend on her groceries. She has underlying health complications that prevent her from working and relies on income support. Her budget is tight, but she just spent $20 on a rapid test. People who's working, $20 might mean nothing to them. It means the world to me. I've used food bank. I've used other ways to get groceries. Kind-hearted people, but I never thought in a million years, or I should say the last two years, I would have had to pay this. The only way she could afford the test was because of a one-time benefit of $200 sent to individuals on income support. It was part of the cost of living plan announced earlier this year. When the cashier at the pharmacy told her it would cost $20, Power thought she was getting a box of tests, not just one. I actually looked at it like this. I said, this is it. It's left Power wondering why government has decided to give some free rapid tests, like children and their families, but not others. The same questions being asked by community groups as well as the opposition party. 34 community organizations and health care providers have signed a letter calling on the Liberal government to increase access to rapid tests, in particular for seniors, vulnerable people, and low-wage workers. I asked the Premier, will this government listen to these organizations or ignore them? I think it's been proven that the, how we've used this test to date has gotten us to a good point in this pandemic, Mr. Speaker. Other jurisdictions have offered them broadly and they've had to roll back, Mr. Speaker. We have a small reserve. Uh, we're expecting another wave in the fall and we want to make sure that we've got rapid tests there uh, to use under public health advice. The St. John's Status of Women Council says it's received a letter back from the provincial government and would disclose the details next week. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. <laughs> We certainly saw some nice weather today. Parts of the Avalon, southern areas of the island as well. The further away from this area of low pressure you were uh, was the nicest weather. And again, that's thanks to an area of high pressure. Zoom in, you can see uh, some of that cloud cover now has moved back in, starting to creep a little bit further south and will continue to do so as we head through the night tonight. Now, we do have a big warm nose of air uh, heading further north. If we take a look at some of those temperatures, 13 degrees in Lab City today, you can see some of that warmer air extending further south. And as we head through the next couple of days, we're going to see a little bit of a colder uh, air mass move in and uh, through the weekend we could even see some snow. But into next week, big pattern change does look like warm temperatures are on the way. I'll get into those details coming up. A man accused of sexually assaulting a teenager after breaking into her home in 2020 has opted to represent himself in court. First, a warning though, some of the details of this case are disturbing. 31-year-old Stephen Hopkins faces several charges including sexual assault, breaking and entering and forcible confinement. The complainant was 17 at the time of the alleged crime. According to the telegram, she testified yesterday describing how Hopkins, whom she didn't know, forcibly entered her Cowan Heights home after asking for a glass of water. She says he then carried her upstairs where he sexually assaulted her. Today, a judge repeatedly interrupted Hopkins' lengthy line of questioning, often stopping to explain how the justice system operates. Hopkins is on the Sexual Offender Registry. He was placed there for a decade after being convicted of attacking two women on Long Pond Trail in St. John's in 2019. The trial continues tomorrow. Eastern Health's clinical chief of cardiac care says more than a dozen people have died while waiting for heart surgery. Dr. Sean Connors says he wants to see the wait list for heart surgery cut by two-thirds. Here now's Mark Quinn reports. Right now, about 150 people are waiting for heart surgery in this province. 
The clinical chief of cardiac care, Dr. Sean Connors, says that has to change. We do need to do better. We do need to offer people, we know we can deliver great care, but great care in a timely fashion. If you're well enough to go home, we would like to get it to you within six weeks. So I would like to be in a position where we have maybe six weeks worth of work, 50 or 60 people on our list. Connor says about 11 cardiac surgeries are being done each week at the Health Sciences Centre in St. John's. With help from surgeons from the Ottawa Health Institute, the wait list is shorter than it was earlier this year, when 200 patients were on it. Still, Connor says patients are waiting too long. It's expected that on average, four patients will die annually while waiting for heart surgery, but it's been more than that for two years. Yes, just like every other jurisdiction that has people on a heart waiting list, we've had people die. And the number of people that we've had die on our wait list now, I'm going right back now, so it was more than a year to early March 2020, is we've had 13 people die on a on heart surgery wait list. Yesterday at the House of Assembly, Progressive Conservative MHA Chris Tibbs talked about one patient who was on the wait list for heart surgery. That patient from the Grand Falls, Windsor, Buckins district that Tibbs represents was sent out of the province for surgery this week. He's a uh, father of two, um, 44 years old, double bypass. He started in Grand Falls, Windsor, waiting on a stretcher for nine days in the emergency room in the hallway, along with many other patients, by the way. Uh, That took him to St. John's, where he's waited now over two weeks to get a cardiac procedure done. Uh, Unfortunately, it's been cancelled twice last week and he's now on his way to Ottawa. And you know what, we thank everybody in the healthcare system, uh, but unfortunately this is not good enough. Um, I believe the minister has failed this man, this patient and so many others. If you do not think we're in a crisis, you are completely out to lunch. Cardiac care is not in crisis right now. If you need surgery today, tonight, tomorrow morning, you're going to get surgery and it's going to be great surgery and you're going to be in good hands. The health minister agrees the wait list for heart surgery is too long. Haggy says recruiting and retaining heart surgeons has always been a challenge, but he expects the wait list will be shortened. In terms of managing the wait list for cardiac care, uh, there are plans drawn up by Eastern Health and the department and Eastern Health will be discussing those over the next few days. Eastern Health says its cardiac care program is excellent and improving. Connor says a new heart surgeon's due here in July and he expects that surgeons from Ottawa will keep coming to Newfoundland and Labrador for at least another five years. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, there's another virus to watch out for. Influenza cases are on the rise and there's an outbreak in Labrador. The health department says there have been 81 lab confirmed cases in the province in the last few weeks. 75 of those are in the Labrador Grenfell Health region. Five are in eastern and just one in the western area. The province says these are the first flu cases in the province since June 2020. Because of the spike in influenza cases, the department will update its weekly flu stats online starting on Friday. In the 2019-2020 flu season, there were 708 lab-confirmed cases of the virus. Well, today is election day for ordinary members of the Nunatsiavut Assembly. The polls opened at 8 a.m. in Inuit communities, including Nain, Hopedale, Makovic, and Rigolet. Nunatsiavut beneficiaries have until 8 p.m. tonight to cast their vote. Nunatsivut Elections Officer Nanette Blake says she isn't sure when the results will be released as there are over 600 mail-in ballots that they have to count, as well as the in-person ones. Well, the first major arrival of Ukrainian refugees to Newfoundland and Labrador will happen on Monday, May 9th. That's just six days from now. now most of them will be women and children. Jerry Byrne, the Provincial Minister for Immigration, says this will be the first plane load of people from the war-torn country and there will be more. We have confirmation of just over 175 seats available for a December, uh, sorry, a May uh, May 9th uh, transport. Uh, We're now working with the federal government that is also considering a charter uh, in the coming weeks, uh, one to land in uh, in Atlantic Canada. We'd like it to be in St. John's and other locations within the within the Atlantic region if, if necessary. But we are the only ones on the ground in Ukraine and we are ready. It takes, it's not an easy task. It's just not simply putting out a, a, an advertisement and saying, get on board. There's a lot of work involved. Well, staying with provincial politics, the minister responsible for women and gender equality says more time is needed to understand the complexities of pay equity legislation. 
I was very actually disheartened and disappointed to see her comments to denounce health care and, and um, sorry, rather child care and the advancements that have been made and what a slap in the face to women it certainly was. Well, Pam Parsons says she's disappointed that female opposition MHAs are attacking her and her department for moving too slowly. But PC critic Helen Conway Ottenheimer says the province is decades behind the other Atlantic provinces when it comes to pay equity legislation. In um, PEI, they enacted uh, the Pay Equity Act in 1988, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick in 1989. And yet here we are, Newfoundland and Labrador women are left behind. This started, this committee was struck four years ago. What have they been doing? Why have there been such delays? I mean, it, all, it makes you think that they have not been working on this. Well, to Quebec now, the late Montreal Canadian icon Guy Lafleur is being remembered today for his kindness, his humility, and his unique style both on and off the ice. Chance of Guy as Lafleur's casket arrived at the cathedral in Montreal, draped in his team's flag. Fans yelled the same chant he must have heard throughout his remarkable career. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Quebec Premier were also among those who attended the national funeral ceremony. Those who personally knew the Hockey Hall of Famer and five-time Stanley Cup champion also grieved his passing. Lafleur died last month at the age of 70 after a battle with lung cancer. While staying with hockey, the Newfoundland Growlers are heading to Game 7 in their bid for the Kelly Cup. The team lost to the Trois-Rivières Lions 7-4 last night. That means the Growlers are tied 3-3 in Round 1 of the series. Game 7 kicks off at 7 o'clock at the Mary Brown Centre in St. John's. Well, you probably heard of Movember, but how about No Mo May? Why doing less to your lawn is better for the bees, coming up. Well, I know the sunshine is good for the bees as you see those flowers coming out. We do have a little bit of snow in the forecast, but I'll have the full forecast coming up.
This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Early bird deadline is midnight, Friday, May 6th. Order tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Actually, this is the time of year where sometimes it's spring and sometimes it's not. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and in some parts of the province, it takes longer to enjoy spring. Yeah, the folks in Labrador West try their best to speed things up. Here now is Daryl Din has that story. Spring is in the air in Labrador West. Squirrels are snacking. Children can be heard with glee as they ride their bikes around town. And the sounds of shovels and snowblowers are everywhere. Mother Nature usually takes her time to get to Labrador West, but people like to give her a nudge. Spring hits, first thing I want to do is I want to get the ice and snow off the driveway. I want to be able to see the pavement. And then I want to get on the grass and uh, see the grass. I get the snow off the grass. Um, it's great to be outdoors. I'm not a snowmobiler or I'm not a cabin person, so it certainly gets me outdoors. It certainly gets me a lot of steps and it certainly gives me an upper body workout. And a little bit of a suntan too on sunny days like today. It's so cold in Labrador West that dirt is used on the roads instead of salt. But in springtime, the dirt creates a layer on top of the snow banks that makes it hard to melt. So you get out and break it down and let the sun shine in. One tip is to spread the snow over your driveway to make it melt quicker. This snow would take days to melt, maybe even a week. So helping it like this will speed everything up. A friendly reminder that shoveling snow onto the sidewalk or street is against the town bylaw. Yeah, I'm a little bit anal. No, I'm a lot anal. My husband thinks I'm out. I've lost my mind when I go at this. He's just like, you know what? Mother Nature put it there. Mother Nature will take it away. But uh, now sometimes Mother Nature needs a help, right? So I'm there to help her. <laughs> As everyone celebrates the melting of snow, we soon have to prepare for all the mosquitoes. Daryl Din, CBC News, Labrador City. Well, it, uh, I noticed some sunglasses there, folks wearing a t-shirt. Yep. Just how warm was it in Labrador City today? It was actually the hot spot across the province. Today, we t you know, temperatures reaching the teens uh, this afternoon, which is quite nice, definitely different. So Mother Nature definitely helping you shovel that snow today. Let's take a look at where uh, we were sitting, or at least I should say melting the snow today. 13 degrees in Lab City today. Churchill Falls there as well. Uh, that is actually the warm spot across the province as we speak. And it was 11 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay today. So Wabush and Churchill Falls Falls. This is the first time that you've seen these types of temperatures since October 13th last year and Happy Valley Goose Bay October 31st. So definitely some nice air in there. Unfortunately, this isn't going to last too long. We are looking at those temperatures dipping uh, as we head through the day tomorrow, but then across the island, uh, much colder, especially in that onshore flow along the northeast coast. Only four degrees in Bonavista today. Uh, warm in Port of Basque, 10 degrees. Marystown reached those double digits as well. Uh, around 11 degrees this afternoon. So the reason for that and all this nice uh, temperatures is because of this big push of mild air uh, thanks to this ridge of high pressure and then all that cloud cover for the northeast keeping you in onshore flow thanks to that area of low pressure to the east and you can see where that cloud cover is sinking south and it is going to continue to sink south as we head through the night tonight. Still looking at that potential for some uh, drizzle as well but Overall, temperatures across the island, you can see, or temperatures across St. John's rather, into uh, the six to seven degree range for a good chunk of the day today. And again, thanks to those northerly winds. So uh, temperatures right now across the province, St. Lawrence at 13 degrees. So you're still seeing a pretty beautiful evening, only around two degrees in Gander as we speak. And then temperatures still absolutely gorgeous up across uh, Lab West and Central Labrador. Happy Valley Goose Bay still sitting at 10 degrees. So as we head through the night tonight, those temperatures are going to dip, especially across the island, uh, anywhere from one to two degrees for a good chunk. Uh, and then for the northern peninsula, as well as the Baver Peninsula, you're still looking at your temperatures hovering around zero or just below. So uh, drizzle will likely be freezing drizzle through the night tonight. And uh, those winds again out of the northwest between 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. Most areas in that onshore flow will see drizzle, maybe even a few flurries again 
for uh, central uh, Newfoundland as we head through the night tonight. Otherwise, southern areas will see light winds and around one degree with partly cloudy skies and rain the story for Lab City. So unfortunately, things will get unsettled as we head through the night. And that's as our next system moves in. That rain will move in as we head through after midnight and then eventually head towards central Labrador as well. It does look like this will fall is rain tonight, but colder air moving right in behind it. Uh, so you will see that chance of flurries as we head through the afternoon tomorrow but uh, should stay as rain as you head towards coastal areas of Labrador again arriving much later in the day. Now as far as the island goes most of the day tomorrow uh, will be generally gray. We may see a few peaks of sun but the clouds will be on the increase as the system starts to move in and then as we head through the evening and overnight hours that's when we should see that chance of more widespread showers and uh, even the potential for a few flurries in some of the higher elevation. So we're talking temperatures between 8 to 10 degrees tomorrow. The wind's still very much out of the north around 20 kilometers per hour, uh, but overall not a bad day. Um, we may see that drizzle in the morning, but then we should see some clearing skies as the day goes on. Again, drizzle the story through central Newfoundland and then uh, as we head towards the west coast, much uh, warmer temperatures between 10 to 11 degrees cooler in that onshore flow for the south. And then Northern Peninsula will see those temperatures in the single digits. Now, as far as Labrador goes, unfortunately, a big drop down to plus four for Lab City through the day. You'll note that wind shift from southerlies to westerlies. That's denoting that cold front moving through. And there's a bit more cool temperatures on the way before we see a warm up next week. I'll get into those details when I come back. The first flowers are starting to bloom across the province. And soon it'll be time for the first lawn mow of the season. But not so fast. The Beekeeper Association in this province is encouraging you to adopt No Mow May. To find out how this helps the bees, we're joined by Don Paul, who's on Fogo Island. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. It's a wonderful day here on Fogo, and, and the uh, headlines have started. And yes, uh, we would like you not to mow them down and, and save them for all pollinators. Okay, so let, let me ask you about that. What benefit do the dandelions have for the bees? So dandelions are one of the first flowers of the spring and the bees and all pollinators have spent a, a very dormant winter just uh, waiting for the first spring nectar and pollen to feed themselves with. The pollen provides protein, the nectar provides the carbohydrates to, to energize them and, and keep them going. And without that, they, they can't brood their new um, bees for the summertime. So the more food they can get, the larger brood they can support and the larger the bee population is ready to pollinate the apples and the cherries and all the other berries when they come in. So every little bit they get uh, provides a larger population. A larger population means better pollination. Better pollination means more beautiful apples, more beautiful flowers, and, and every gardens um, actually take benefit from that. And not to mention, uh, the pollinators have, uh, have had a tough time in the years gone by with uh, um, some pesticide issues and other things. So this boost really helps. So um, yeah, the Newfoundland Beekeeping Association is running a, a bit of a, a they would like you to take pictures of your dandelions and post them on their social social media sites and uh, under the hashtag no mo may 2020 and th anybody who does that their name will be entered into a draw for great newland honey that uh, we'll be collecting at this year's annual general meeting this coming weekend Dandelions are normally something that people spend a lot of time and effort to get out of their lawns. They're a weed. Uh, people don't want them growing there. How much of a thought change is it uh, f to convince people to let them grow rather than getting rid of them? It, it, there is a big stigma to overcome because most people prefer that pristine, perfect green lawn that we're so used to seeing. But that sucks up a lot of of uh, water and, and other elements. Whereas when you let it go wild and not just uh, da dandelions, you'll get bluebells and other violets and, and other uh, wildflowers that'll show up. 
and it, it becomes a whole uh, ecosystem, a microcosm for the wild insects to um, to propagate, and it just helps out so much. And we're not saying that you should do this all summer long. It's really important for the spring. The month of May and, and most of June is the time when there's not a lot of nectar out there for the for the bees to begin with. So this is really helpful for them. And it gets everybody aware while we're doing it. And, and everybody gets quite accustomed to the kind of un, untamed look of the lawns. And, and you might even dedicate a certain spot that you might always leave wild and, and then groom the other spots later on in the summer. Well, thanks for joining us and for giving me an excuse to not have to tend to my lawn this month. Th yes. Thanks for speaking with me. You're more than welcome, Peter. Thank you so much. And everybody have a wonderful spring as it comes.
Matea Rocha's Jeopardy winning streak continues. The Canadian is now tied for the fifth highest winnings in the history of regular season Jeopardy. And while the rest of us are watching at home, on the couch or online, there is a party underway every night at her parents' home in Halifax. And the CBC's Kayla Hounsel was invited to cheer along with them. Welcome, welcome. They begin arriving 90 minutes before the show starts. Barbecues on, cake and other personalized treats arrive. I love this one with the hands. And for a while, it's pretty electric. Hilariously, we had no idea we would still be doing this a month later. That's Matea's Aunt Amy, and every night for 21 nights now, she's been here. There's so much drama. Like the drama is happening every night and it's different drama every night. When the clock strikes 8.30, they all gather around. Her parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, even her high school debate coach and principal. Oh, oh, here we go. Okay. Then things get serious. And our returning champion, <laughs> Things get off to a close start. I'm really a nervous wreck right now. <laughs> she usually answers first and... A number of games she's run the category, so... That didn't happen today. Didn't happen tonight, so... Only her parents and brothers know the final outcome. Like, in some really close games, I was still scared that she was going to lose, even though I knew that she had won. If a daily double comes up, I still get nervous, because we don't know the details of the mm -hmm. game. It's the daily double in the round. And it's really good when she gets the daily doubles, because then other people don't. Sorry, that's not nice to the other people, but... But they don't always go her way. Matea? What is a rock? No, I'm sorry. There's no talking during the game, so I jump in on a commercial to chat with Aunt Amy again. It's very tense, and she doesn't have double the next person. I like it when she has more than double the person in second. Finally, it's time for final Jeopardy. What is Julius Caesar? That's correct. And she's done it again. Now the youngest super champ in Jeopardy history. Her family couldn't be more proud. But they insist this is Matea's story. They're just happy to share in the joy of watching her success. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Such a great story, eh, Peter? Yeah, and there's a lot of people. It's not just that group there. I think a lot of people across the country are tuning in every night with their fingers crossed, really well, hoping that streak continues. Yeah, my in-laws in Quebec uh, talk about it all the time. Now to Quebec, as we reported earlier, the late hockey legend Guy Lafleur was given a final send-off at a national funeral ceremony in Quebec today. And as his casket arrived at the cathedral in downtown Montreal, a familiar chant spontaneously broke out. Yeah, it's the cheer the man wearing number 10 has heard countless times during his heyday. Alison Northcott takes us there. Just as they did when he would take the ice, fans chanted Guy Lafleur's name as his casket, draped in a Montreal Canadiens flag, was carried into the cathedral. We came here just to honour who he was, who he is, who he will always be for us. Hundreds came to say goodbye to a hockey giant who won five Stanley Cups and inspired generations of fans and players. He was a great man, generous and good, good partner on, on the team. Pierre Bouchard was his teammate. Always was nice to us. He did most of the job, but it's all right. We, we followed, we, we took the credit after. To say thank you to Guy Lafleur for everything he gave us over uh, so many years. All, all the wins, all the inspiration, the incredible games he played. Um, but also his deep humanity. Inside, Lafleur was remembered as passionate, extraordinary, irreplaceable. He was not only a superstar, Hall of Fame hockey player, but also a warm, humble, and normal human being with an outstanding sense of humor. I could go on for hours talking about the kind of person Guy was. Former teammate Larry Robinson reflected on losing both Lafleur and former player Mike Bossy all in recent weeks. Heaven has them now, and it is my hope and my prayer that they're not looking for a big defenseman just yet. Thank you. Lafleur's son, Martin, said from an early age he knew his father was someone exceptional. Merci pour toutes les valeurs que tu nous transmises, Dad. Nous t'aimons. Thank you for the values you imparted on us, Dad, he said. We love you. And now the end is near. 
As the ceremony ended and La Fleur's casket was carried away, Frank Sinatra's My Way played outside the church for the man known to chart his own path. His widow, Lise, looked out at the crowd of fans across the street as they cheered, thank you, Guy, one last time. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Welcome back. The new mental health and addictions hospital is under construction in St. John's and today we got a peek at what it could look like. Some rooms have been constructed to give clinical staff an idea so they can give feedback on what works and what doesn't before it's actually built. Clinical project manager Krista Wade explains. So I guess we'll get started. We have three spaces to show you this morning. That was part of The mock-up has been a really uh, an integral part of the planning and design for the new facility. We've had upwards of 80 staff, so frontline staff, physicians. We've had our IPAC team, occupational health, people with lived experience, our recovery council who've gone through. We had upwards, I think, of 17 pages worth of recommendations based on that, and we've really um, attempted to incorporate as much of that as we can into the designs. 
I think overall it's been uh, fantastic. People are asking when can we move in? <laughs> so really excited about the project, uh, but certainly the feedback has resulted in changes like just subtle things, a change in the flooring, for example, in the geriatric bedroom to one that's less uh, busy. Um, the epoxy flooring we've looked at, you know, the amount of slip resistance that we needed. Uh, we made some subtle changes to the nursing station in terms of the uh, wheelchair accessibility area on the acute unit. So, um, as I said, numerous changes, but uh, it'll all definitely improve the design. Well, a new study has found Inuit from Nunavut's Baffin region are more likely to experience complications after surgery than others. The data revealed that they aren't getting the medical attention they need and on time because it's not available in the north. Juanita Taylor has the details from Rankin Inlet, Nunavut. The study looks at seven years worth of data from Inuit in Nunavut's Baffin region who received treatment at the Ottawa Hospital. Researchers found that Inuit experience more complications after surgery than the general population. Inuit patients did have an increase in of 25% of surgical complications um, at 30 days. Um, that was even higher when it came to elective surgery at 58% and even higher than that at 63% higher when it came to cancer surgery. Dr. McVicker is a member of the Red River Settlement in Manitoba. He says Canada's health system has not been designed for Indigenous people. He says by the time patients arrive down south for treatment, their disease or condition has been diagnosed too late or missed altogether. Another author of the study agrees. Inuk cardiac surgeon Donna Mekimaljuk was part of the research team. I think the biggest contributors to this are the barriers in accessing timely and culturally appropriate health care. Um, so there's a lot of factors, but I think the biggest one is it's very difficult for folks who are in a, you know, living in remote communities. Dr. Kimaljuk says Nunavut need more staffing at local health centers, so blood tests, x-rays and ultrasounds can be performed quicker. She also suggests investing in the Qikiktani General Hospital in Iqaluit so patients can stay in the territory for treatment rather than being flown to hospitals in Ottawa, where the study shows outcomes can be much worse due to delays. Juanita Taylor, CBC News, Rankin Inlet, Nunavut. A leaked document indicates the U.S. Supreme Court may be ready to strike down the legal right to abortion. The draft document outlines reasons the country's highest court could overturn the landmark Roe v. Wade ruling, the 1973 decision that legalized abortion nationwide. As Katie Simpson reports, while this is a draft and not a final decision, it has set off shockwaves across the political spectrum as well as protest in Washington. Moments of tension in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. A mix of anger and disbelief clashing up against celebration and relief as access to abortion in this country appears poised to dramatically change. It's just jarring um, and heartbreaking to me. It's a turning point. Um, we, we, we love babies in America. The news outlet Politico obtained a leaked draft of a Supreme Court opinion that would overturn Roe v. Wade, the decision that has protected access to abortion for nearly 50 years. A majority of justices say decisions about abortion should instead be made by state governments and ultimately voters. While the court confirms the draft is authentic, it warns it does not represent the final decision. If the rationale of the decision as released were to be sustained, the whole range of rights are in question. While they don't have the votes, the president and fellow Democrats are vowing to try to pass legislation that would protect abortion access on a national level. Is this a turning point for the United States? Yes. Tell me why. Never in our lifetime has we seen a right that was in place for 50 years suddenly with a court that's been stacked with conservatives, that it's not consistent where the American people are, we suddenly see them um, basically flip it on its head. At least 13 states have previously passed so-called trigger laws, which automatically ban abortion if Roe v. Wade is overturned. 
Some Republicans worry the leak was meant to pressure the justices to change course, as they hope the draft opinion stands. The laws will reflect the values and the mores of the citizens who live there. That's the way our democracy is supposed to work. The court's final decision is expected sometime in either June or July. As the country anxiously waits, the court has launched a formal investigation into the leak. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Okay, before we bring Ashley back for the weather, we're going to head to PEI, where it is the first day of the spring lobster season. It's known there as setting day. Setting day, yes. Every year, crowds of people line the wharves, harbors, and beaches to watch the boats head out for yet another season. And our CBC cameras are there to ask, so just why is setting day so significant? <laughs> So tell us what you're doing out here this morning. Oh, I'll start crying. This is my favorite morning of the year. Beats Christmas. Like everybody loves to come and wave and... And everybody's supporting their loved ones and their, their friends for the same reason. It's the excitement. Everyone could feel the excitement of the new season starting. Happy setting day. 
it's just an important day. We all eat lobster, but we don't realize the work that goes into it. And we see them go past our house every morning in crappy weather and they earn their keep. It's crazy. I grew up on a farm, so this is totally different, but yeah, I just, it's amazing. The atmosphere down at the wharf, it's just, it's electric. Everybody's just hyper. And every year the crowd grows and grows and I love it. It's just, it gives you goosebumps to think that people are supporting all of the fisher men and fisher women. It's definitely fun. Yeah. Huh? Do you think it's fun? It's definitely yeah. a family tradition for us. My husband owns a gear and like I said, has been fishing for many years. So it's kind of a nice family tradition to come and see them go. It means an early morning, but so much joy watching them play in the water and just have fun and splash around. Certainly exciting. And wave to daddy, right? Uh, we had big waves this morning. <laughs> My husband fishes out of this harbor. Our son, uh, Matthew, fishes with him, Gracie's father. So she was pretty excited to be here today to see him off. Really great. We get such a, such a large group of people that come and they don't necessarily have uh, family members that fish, but they come out to support their, their neighbors or their friends or just the community in general. It's one of the most spectacular days in all of PEI and I think it really just shows the heart of the island. And people are out here, people don't mind getting up, they're excited to be here and it's just so magical. I cry every year because you can just feel the energy and everyone's so excited for the lobster season and hope that the fishermen have like a bountiful season. <laughs>
uh, change, I should say, by a degree or two until we get there. By Sunday, uh, sunshine for you in western Newfoundland. Now for eastern Labrador, you're looking at your temperatures climbing as well, likely back to the double digits for Lab West by the time we get to the end of the weekend. We talked about bees. Ah. Got to share some spring flowers. Barbara shared this photo with us. Uh, thank you so much for that. If you have any weather photos, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. They're coming out of their hives. They're tanking up after a long winter with not much to eat. Yeah. And they are enjoying these flowers finally coming out. Yeah. Carolyn Stokes is not here, but she would definitely have All proof <laughs> of this evening's show. No question. She definitely would have. <laughs> What's the date tomorrow? Today, tomorrow is May the 4th. May the 4th. Ah, it is May the 4th. It is May so the 4th. So Star Wars Day. Yes, and we will have a story tomorrow that you will not believe, so make sure to tune in. It has to do with um, a certain enthusiast in our audience, and uh, it's going to be quite remarkable, so don't miss it. And may the 4th be with you. <laughs> have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.